Hello everyone and welcome back to another podcast from the Cloud Security Alliance. Today we have uh, the pleasure to uh, have Stephen Owen with us that is going to introduce us on the topic of uh, uh, Cloud Center of Excellence. Before that, we'll, we'll run some, um, some logistics and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing with the Cloud Security Alliance and specifically with the UK chapter. So the UK chapter, um, we are um, a local chapter that operates in UK, Ireland, and uh, we do webinars, events, uh, we do outreach with uh, university, and we do some research, blogging, and stuff. So if you want to join us, if you want to participate, if you want to get more uh, public with your work, or if you want to get involved with a wider community of cybersecurity experts and cloud security experts, Please join us. We need we need your hand, your skills, your expertise, your brain, and your passion for cloud security. So please join us. Um, we are running this webinar on a weekly basis on Wednesday usually. Uh, we will put every Wednesday live uh, and up on uh, YouTube on our channel. These are our contacts. So if you want to join us, our uh, via Twitter or our LinkedIn group to get notified of the latest news and information. Also, please visit us at uh, www.cloudsecuritalliance.org.uk, where we have all the latest information, events of both the chapter and global. Uh, the chapter is growing. This is uh, the current member list. Uh, we have the pleasure to have Louis Paul uh, on the call today. Um, and I'd like to welcome Stephen Owen. Stephen Owen is currently a very pragmatic and, and good friend and, and a pragmatic security leader. Um, he's been involved in cloud security for quite a while uh, with touch base here and there. And uh, of recent, he was a CISO of one large leisure company, but I'll let Stephen introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about what you do and what you will do today. What do we talk to us today? Stephen? Yeah, thank you, Fran. Much appreciated. Um, so today's session is about the Cloud Center of Excellence. So I think I've been working in the cloud space for at least 12 years, whether it be architecture, security, and through probably five or six different organizations from banks to medium-sized businesses, I've observed lots of different traits. Some people have not gone to the cloud correctly or gone to the cloud and thought they have but perhaps need to improve that level of quality um, so aws and azure have different terminologies but this is today's presentation is condensed of experience fellow security architects and leaders and also some pointers from aws and azure as well what they consider best practice Thank you, Stephen, and um, welcome everybody. Keep the people keep on joining, but just a re reminder: this will will be recorded and will go up on YouTube. So don't worry if you lost some pieces or, or some bits and bobs. Uh, See, I'm a security person. I don't default. <laughs> you don't allow. default share. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. By default, is unshareable. Exactly. So that's the first part. Tell you what, I'll. Uh, I'll drive it and okay. I'll drive it and then you can tell me when to change slide. Okay. So in the meantime. I feel very privileged that you're going to be my uh, button presser. Your clicker. <laughs> I'm your personal clicker. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so the cloud center of excellence, so it's a well-recognized term, but an actual fact. Go on, I, Stephen Owen, I'll pass the presenter to you. I'll, I'll be your personal clicker. How thank about you. that? Thank you, Fran. And also you can bail out the boat and mute other people. Um, <laughs> so if you want to bring up the slides. Thank you. So before we are rudely interrupted, I'm sure we may be later on as well. So this is, a snapshot of several years experience and also colleagues in the industry. Uh, cloud security architects, fellow architects and security leaders 
we've tried to condense a set of experiences and there's not one size that fits all but the whole goal is even if you've gone to the cloud or moving or on a journey of digital transformation or forklifting old applications there's some simple steps that you can take to make that journey quite smooth and also if you've if you've gone to the cloud and if it's not quite working correctly you haven't got the right metrics we're hoping to give you something in the armory today or to take away and think well perhaps i can start adopting some of those techniques to get better metrics or reduce our costs or you know stand up uh, capability a lot faster so the whole idea of a cloud center of excellence or enablement is really it's a cohort of a team uh, and this team some people could say well is it a change board no it's not is it a technical design review board no not really um, because from experience i've seen that uh, some organizations apply a non-set uh, mindset fellow security practitioners as well architects solution architects and even some of the senior leadership they take well what has worked for us on premise let's transpose that into the cloud and that's not always right and this goes down to some of your processes so i think to make it efficient of going to the cloud quickly and maintaining it it's worth standing up a small cohort of qualified people and giving that cohort of people that small team the right mandate to make sure it's successful um, i've seen in the past where perhaps a technical change board or design review board people are reviewing designs perhaps they may not be qualified for bringing some past experiences where in actual fact in cloud you might operate it differently so if you want a very agile team is bringing together some different disciplines into this. Um, so one of the key areas is making sure this small cohort has got the right mandate. And this comes down from the leadership, the CIO, CTO, and also the CISO as well, is to make sure that they've got the buy-in and certainly on a business stakeholders that if they feel it's sometimes abstracted from them but if you're doing a digital transformation and going to the cloud and you might be standing up a big data platform with lots of different third-party SaaS providers digital providers the business stakeholder all they want at the end of the day is delivery on time at a fast pace but it's also to be able to mindset of grow because if you're collecting lots of large data most certainly you want to do a lot of innovation and analytics and sweat that data to drive business benefit so they want to make sure that you're not creating a static monolith but you've got the capability to grow and shrink with this design so it's making sure there's senior business stakeholders and the leadership have given you the mandate go ahead go forth and sometimes that might require clipping the wings of other processes as well so the clear mandate is look sometimes you'll change frequency it might be the idea is that you fail fast you know that's a, one of the uh, the google mantras and you're not trying to cheat uh, it's more of a cattle and pets so microsoft terminology is you have you're not treating your applications as pets but treat them as cattle so your change frequency, the goal is to be fast. Sometimes if you have technical review boards, we keep meeting monthly, weekly, or daily, sometimes that should be hourly as well. So again, it depends on the maturity of the organization. Some of that mandate could be transferred over to this small cohort as well. Another key, key one is, if you're doing a task three or four times an operative why not orchestrate it through code and make it more repetitive so again this is the devops culture so if you go to an ops room and every day you see them downloading the some of the metrics why not orchestrate that in code 
And another one as well is this team is there to enable the rest of the business. So it's a lot of encourage and knowledge sharing and experimentation. So recently I've done this by doing brown paper bag fun days. And uh, one of them is, and this is generating this level of awareness of getting in Microsoft and talking over lunch with lots of different business stakeholders uh, from architects, data analysts, data scientists, of this is the different way of managing data. Then I got another data analyst in from a big data point, point of view and from a business perspective, how he saw the cloud and using. Another one was a pen tester. He ran a, in a sandpit environment, how to actually, this is the process of doing cross-site scripting, but all focused on the cloud and it makes it bring, brings the subject to life. And the whole goal is knowledge sharing and it's encouraging developers, you know, an hour, two hours on a Friday afternoon to do some sandpit experiments and it should be fun. But this cohort, this center of excellence should be able to rapidly return round to a developer's request and say, can I have a sandpit environment? And the, probably one of the biggest drivers I've seen for existing customers who've gone to the cloud is I hear a 50, 60,000 pounds spend. And when you do a cost analysis on a certain project, once you've tagged all of the assets, in actual fact, you could have reduced that down by hmm, probably about 90, 95%. It's coming back to the basics of, if you design it right, of this is ta talking about immutable infrastructure, sizing your instances and getting the right basics. So, Again, you often see the on-premise mindset, I need the same size of instances in the cloud. Well, in actual fact, perhaps not. And it's addressing it in architecture, but also the operational aspect. So this is part of this mandate, is they're constantly trying to shrink the cost down because different techniques, different price points in the cloud as well. So this cohort of team, and we'll go through each of the roles who make up this cohort, you know, that's part of their mandate is making sure they knowledge share, fun, making sure they cost reduction constantly and repetitive, repetitive tasks, make sure they eliminate. And the main thing is innovation. You really want to support the business at pace. So if it's one or two weeks to review a design or react, that's way too we're talking of hours at pace and it can be done. So one of the key areas of leading this cohort is getting the right leadership. And this isn't a C-level, this is an experienced cloud leader. So it could be a, a seasoned cloud architect who's probably gone through several levels of implementation. And I've also seen sometimes in areas where if you don't have that in-house expertise, is you actually bring in a third party, but as a consultant, he wears your cap and he'll sit on your daily Slack channel or your hours stand up, daily stand up, and be that leader and also there to knowledge share as well. So if you don't have in-house qualified uh, experience, bring in a third party. And this is a seesaw approach that he should be mentoring the actual nurturing other cloud experts in that cohort. Another one, I've, I've seen this over the, these constant conflicting arguments of, well, in actual fact, with a DevOps approach, you might not need architecture. You know, you rapid deploy things at pace, but one argument is, well, in actual fact, that's very, very true. You can stand up a capability very, very quickly, but, you do need that holistic view of architecture of how it grows because it's going to morph over time. Should you go for uh, a container-based or totally server serverless architecture? And if you know that your project or capability is going to grow in the future, that's where you need that architecture roadmap and not just looking at the cold face today and delivering off your Kanban boards, deploy, deploy, deploy. Sometimes you're missing that enterprise architecture. So 
that's part of this governance leadership is there to keep us to that strategy um, and also the governance side as well so he's making sure that governance is followed so you might be in PCI majority of uh, platforms in the cloud now handling privacy so it's making sure that your right controls are in place as I go through each of these roles you'll actually see some of them have hot spots on each of these areas but the key one is making sure that leadership has that the people have I wouldn't say jump through the hoops because that's making sure it's like it's archaic but making sure this standard logical diagram is presented the cost of ownership are the tagging strategies correct and it's also a balance of preventative techniques and making sure that a level of discipline is adopted and again i've seen in organizations where the management and the pmo office are very used to the waterfall style of delivery but the DevOps and the DevSecOps and some of the cloud architects are used to very agile Kanban and it's marriaging those. And again, that's where this leadership, this single person should be able to blend in this and counsel the PMO and work with the, uh, the project managers and program managers, but also balance with the DevOps team as well and not frustrate them. So some of the attributes of these team members you mentioned earlier, so it could be um, de developers, DevOps, DevSecOps, but this, a team shouldn't be more than five, six people. And so if you're standing up a new project, so let's take I'm standing up a big data platform uh, or transitioning a legacy application from on-premise to the cloud, each of these members will make sure that their areas or this design goes through them first and then it's presented to this cohort which would ideally meet daily but they're making sure that these key areas they're specialized in they've hit the certain marks and they'll bring it together and there will be a collaboration between this cohort of people to make sure you know have we got the right uh controls in place, compliance, have we thought about uh, the tagging strategy, do we need to evolve it, who is the business owner, how about the RTO, RPO, you know, what's the cost of the different environments, what's the running cost, do we have the right metrics in place, you know, what's the actual code pipeline going to look like as well, how are we going to live with it, so they'll be asking lots of different questions amongst themselves and the leader cloud leader is supposed to tease this out of them as well so i've mentioned earlier this ccre is typically made up of five people and it will change uh, you have the traditional devops the developer the devsecops and the cloud architect and sometimes i've seen in some larger projects that will be supplemented also with the cloud security architect as well and I think I've seen a transition, a different of what you're doing. If it's a totally native cloud application, you're not transitioning on-premise uh, applications. You may just have a DevOps, but I've seen a mix of DevOps and developers because I've seen arguments, well, dev DevOps is the same as developer. Well, you, I'd probably argue that I've seen presentation layers if I'm developing, developing in React, let's say, but he won't totally appreciate if I'm doing code pipelines with infrastructure and there's sort of dis different disciplines and also the day jobs that the developer may not be looking at his Slack channel that if I've got a, an outage or the metrics utilization, CPU utilization is down um that won't be caught that developer so they are different disciplines even today as well the devsecops is he should be parachuted in he should be shoulder to shoulder with the developers 
But again, he reports into the CCOE, and if there are several DevSecOps in the larger organizations, you'll see several of these roles, but he should have a foot in the CCOE, but also in the, the DevOps community. The cloud architect and the cloud security architect are really the business facing. They should take the burden off. And I've seen solution architects trying to fill this role. And again, they need to grow into it. Um, so we understand the DevOps, you know, that they're there to look after the infra, the code pipeline and making, get, making sure the tools are operation. And again, if containers, uh, you might have one set of teams looking after the containers and all of the infrastructure, but the developers will be looking after all they care about is their image. How it gets deployed thereafter is often transparent to them. So it's a balance of skills. So I won't really through, run through all of them, but some of the key ones are what I've observed of how teams are making, how teams are efficient is metrics. And I would say that's a common pattern through everything. Try and get metrics in from day one, even through your code pipeline, your security, your architecture, your tagging. If you can get your metrics in and it will evolve over time, you can then start reporting back to your senior stakeholders, but also start improving. If you can measure it, you can improve it. So that's probably one of the key takeaways. Think about day one metrics. Um, next slide. I talked about earlier about the difference of DevOps and developers, and now you're starting to see some of the difference. They're considering that maybe container images. I may not see a de classical developer, you know, look, developing Lambda or functions. That's more of a DevOps capability. I might be doing the presentation layer or where it can get a slight blur that if I'm doing workflow engines, and now I'm a more of a back-end business functionality, creating API stubs. Um, so there are different disciplines. So you might have from day one in that cohort of people on your center of excellence, one of your developers sitting in on the center of excellence. Next slide. I think the cloud architect uh, and the cloud security architect are probably one of the key pivotal roles in this. That I've seen uh, different clients ranging from banks to other organizations, um, perhaps not going to the cloud in the right way. They've taken, I'm going to forklift this capability, or I've heard of this other capability of, let's say, uh, a, big data, um, a big data platform, and they're all taking some old design techniques or not heard of perhaps different data pipelines and different strategies. Um, having that cloud architect and that review process is so key, but they should at minimum deliver a few artifacts. So I've seen 60, 80 page high level design documents and you read it and after reading it, you think that's not told me much. And it's that's going to be a real killer to maintain. So the key ones you're looking for is a logical diagram, please. The next one is an interface diagram. And with that is also, I'd say, the data flow, flowing how the data flows and through that interface diagram with a logical diagram. And I, how the, does that relate, relate to the high level design and what sort of patterns am I going to use? He should be using from his, when I say talk about patterns, they are think of those pre-built Lego bricks and the DevOps and the cloud architect should be coming up with these standard, we call them objects, you know, whether it be Terraform, Ansible, these standard patterns to make you go faster, but he should be trying to build and use these standard patterns. And also the cost model. So if I'm designing something, I should be able to cost it up with a, as your Oracle calculator, um, also the AWS cost calculator, I should be able to have an estimation of the different costs of my environments. 
those key elements and the metrics against them are the minimum deliverables. So that's what you should be looking for. So when a new project is coming or a major change, the center of excellence should review that information. Instead of reading through a 96 page document, he should be able to read through six or seven different pages and suddenly any cloud person should be able to understand and decipher this is what this design is about. I understand how the flow is data. The security people will be looking at the interface diagram, the ports and protocols, along with that data flow diagram. They should be able to start understanding the threats and the analysis as well. A key one, anything to do with the cloud, I would strongly advocate a data catalog. And the data catalog, initially, instead of going down to the field level, even at high level category of what data is flowing where. And this goes back into your interface diagram and your data flow diagram. So they go hand in hand. So to bring this to life, I was at an organization in the cloud and one of our third parties connecting to our big data platform, we were doing analysis of their third party. So we're doing um, profiling of different vendors, legitimate, and we, we were alerted that they had a breach. We wanted to know what data they were consuming off our cloud. We, well, of course, they had legitimate access, you know, authentication, author authorization, but we went to the catalog and we actually saw this is the data they were consuming. Privacy people, essential as well. And this also links into some of the legislation as well, all around the world now, though you need to understand what people are access, what data and the reasons why as well. Also evolves to data retention. So these four elements are very, very key. So you can see the DevSecOps has got a lot of high level bullet points. Um, they are the, I would call it the CISO's eyes into the cloud. Um, I've dealt with several different uh, DevSecOps and parachuted them in amongst the DevOps. So he's there to support. And I think it's half of it is making sure there's security in the pipeline, but the other half is the psychology and making sure the behavior is right. So he's not there with a stick. It is all it just shoulder to shoulder with the DevOps people, making sure that the reusing patterns correctly. It will evolve over time. Um, but the goal is that instead of doing it three or four times, try and fix it once, twice uh, correctly to make sure that your Terraform objects are correct, that they are using a control tower or those sort of patterns. So when I say control tower, I've gone to several organizations where, and again, same on Azure as well, that they have a, a strategy of subscriptions, is that how you structure your accounts and how you, who has access to what accounts and the interconnection between your accounts, the logging, the access controls, this is the control tower pattern and it's morphed over the last few years but now it's like a cookie cutter approach but adopting these basics again this is where the the cloud architects and the cloud devsecops work closely together but it's not a stick but it's got a lot of work to do and it gets easier and eventually you might find the devsecops person stepping back that once he's got that culture in place and the building blocks and reporting into the code pipeline back into the DevOps, within reason, it should be self-managing so he can all start thinking laterally. And, you know, that when I go into cloud, cloud teams and I ask them, well, how do I do a forensic snapshot? You can start seeing this cloud maturity and you can start setting the set of questions. So recently, um, this leads nicely onto, I can see as you are now starting. So over the last few years, you can see that 
to do cloud maturity almost defines you need a set of set patterns and an evolution of capability there. So with Azure doing uh, cloud maturity patterns, and again, Cloud Security Alliance now promoting the cloud audit, I think you're now seeing this discipline, but the DevSecOps is key to making sure that capability is in there. So I think the, the one of the simple ones is, if I was to put a request in, or the, if I was a developer, how do I how do I get started? Well, create a little questionnaire. It could be an online form, and you push it around to all of the dev dev teams, um, even if they're not doing any cloud accounts, and ask them to fill out some questions, and it's submitted to your Slack channel, the the center of excellence team. They'll review it for different questions and grant you access within 12 hours. That's what it should be. But they can start keeping it track. So, but some of these questions, it might be, well, I've got a new project. And you might answer some, ask some questions. So, you know, is it contained personal information? So that will spike the cloud architect, the leader to say, well, perhaps we should do a privacy impact assessment even before you're starting to do some definitive designs but also it might be uh, if I'm transitioning an on-premise uh, legacy applications to the cloud well is it mutable am I going to treat it like pets or cattle and we talk about golden images of well in actual fact I've seen on-premise patch patching it can be quite always a difficult well this is a perfect opportunity to do patching correctly in the cloud but you might patch one image a golden image and reuse it if it's quite a brittle application and you there's some really exciting things coming out of aws that if i build a golden image now and uh, i can export that image back to on-premise because sometimes you'll have an on-premise and a cloud and they work together one might be a dr so you can spin off some of the benefits. Also some of the requests of containers. As Soon as you, I see the word containers, I instantly think of the provenance. So the DevSecOps or are they asking some questions or trying to encourage them of looking at the provenance of where those containers are coming from. So these simple questions can really get you going very, very quickly. I think I've gone at a fast pace, but, um, and there's a lot of areas to cover, but I think the takeaway is gather four or five people as a standard and pass questions through them and designs. It may be a design review body, but they are a guiding light. And if you get that right, you will save significant amounts of money of you go to the cloud, then having to redo it second or third iteration. So open to questions, Brian? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump, yeah. Um, aside from how do you secure <laughs> video conference and how do you meet people uh, quietly? But uh, jokes aside, so pragmatic, I think it's, it's the word that you use over and over and uh, structure it over and over. So assuming that we start uh, any, any kind of organization that wanna start cloud security, or, or start in the cloud. So what are the logical steps they will naturally take, like pragmatic logical step? Um, of going to the cloud, I think the first one is, uh, to, when I go into organizations, I always do a skill matrix. So what team do I have? I list their skills, I pull the CVs, get to know your team. And the other side is I understand, I'll sit with the business stakeholders, and so I was recently sitting with the digital officer. I've sat with data officers and saying, tell me your ambitions. Where would you like to be in a couple of years time? Um, and you have to gradually, question. you'll have a few of those sessions and you can start marrying up. Well, I know what skills I currently have. I know their ambitions and the strategy, 
and the one year, three year, five years, and the, you speak to the CTO, yes, they want to more some of your legacy applications, and you can start building up your strategy of capability of what you need with what team you currently have, what cross-training, and where you need to supplement it. And that might then come out to, well, I know I need perhaps cloud patterns, cloud security patterns, I need DevOps, I might have a contractor in for DevSecOps initially, but I want to cross-train. I think the key takeaway is train your guys, because most of the guys on the ground, I find, are so passionate and want to be grown into this capability, but you need to supplement their skills initially. With a mix between, and mix between internal upskilling and SME that comes in and, and uh, lay the foundation of. Exactly. The last thing you want to do is outsource it, and I've I've seen this done before. I've had, you've seen outsourcing. I've seen outsourcing nightmare. I've seen outsourcing it, nightmare. They don't understand the business. Exactly, and suddenly you're losing. You will suddenly have your S3 buckets open. And yes, it can happen on premise, but again with the DevSecOps and the Cloud Center of Excellence and that cohort. It's all about that risk reduction. And some also just say, well, it wasn't in my scope. <laughs> exactly. Security is not in my briefing. contract. <laughs> what risk am I guessing? <laughs> but, yeah. So but maybe, maybe, maybe we pick on, on that topic and we say continuous compliance versus one or So I've, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of time, okay, I need to secure something. I'll just do one pass or I'll do one audit and then that's it. And then the organization keep on evolving. So how do we shift, in your opinion, the mindset from, okay, do we do a one-off security assessment and maybe fix and remediate some stuff, or do we do continuous compliance when we see divergent from the norm? I, I think you need to do both. It's a strategy of, depending on the maturity of the organization, but I would advocate before it, anything you put into, if we go for the classical, uh, the dev, the stage, the prod, as you promote, even if it can contain as a legacy, as you promote something into the stage, I would do an audit then, because if you, if the stage is going to look anything like your prod, you want to capture it at the stage environment. And I've created AWS audit sheets, mm -hmm. and it was only, I think, 40 questions, linking to best practices of P1s to P3s. And it. I remember those average, sheets. <laughs> yeah, you remember those sheets. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot of people. And it, it's really to give you a weather vane of look, this is what I care about the P1s and P2s. You shouldn't go into production at all. Try and fix it in dev, re promote it. So that's the audit perspective. And it really captures some of the basics, which what the CCOE would capture during this life cycle. But I think that's, that's a natural evolution of the cloud control yeah. matrix that uh, is currently being worked on. So we, we have the version far, four or but five. Then, in, but in, then your other point of living it in compliance, mm. because I've seen something in production, you know, if you haven't adopted some good regimes, they go out of patch or suddenly an S3 bucket has made it up which is probably majority of the breaches nowadays of S3 buckets. You can have the best will in the world, but a DevOps, you've got a PM over, uh, sitting over you sometimes. You've got your Kanban boards, you've got a large do, amount do, of do, do, do. Accidents do happen. So yeah. this is where I've instructed DevSecOps. Yes, in theory it can't happen, but try and put in that double, triple checking in some of the key areas, and this is a week for all about the surface mapping, no surface of the cloud. I agree, but even in the best case scenario, you you have the best intentions, people, but as you say, there is pressure, there is priority. So naturally, in any organization, I've seen uh, step be missed, security check be missed. So something that audit continuously and continuous compliance. Uh, will effectively take you aside from that. So you go from architecture, for example, to incident response, where you continuously monitor and you react to incident. So but this, I think you, uh, what I've seen is you have the internal looking capabilities and you have these past capabilities from 
Azure and AWS, which are really, really good. But I would strongly advocate that you also have an outside looking in. So if I was a, um, a malicious intent, I would start doing um, what is the weakest part? service, yeah. You're trying to enumerate your environment. Now with that mindset of what APIs have I exposed? And I'd start getting the DevSecOps from a third party cloud provider, testing all of the APIs, websites, injecting, scanning all of my S3 buckets, trying to discover. And there are lots of tools out there trying to walk your S3s. So that's what I do outside in as well. And that's a lot of organizations miss that key part, but it will save you. I know I've seen quite recently of, I was mapping a surface and suddenly I found FTP ports open, um, WordPress sites. So you'll be surprised what you discover when you start mapping your surface. Paul has a question. Go for it, Paul. Yeah, so Stephen, to play devil's advocate with you, cloud centers of excellence are, are great as long as everyone knows about them and agrees to play in them. <laughs> um, so how how is the cloud center of excellence or even the CIO or the CISO, do you get a proper understanding in a large organization of what other things people are doing outside of the cloud center of excellence and more importantly sort of where your corporation's data is going um, so that you you get a full picture i think there are several really juicy questions in that okay the one is the, <laughs> the one is a culture of behavior so the cio and the CISO need to have strength and confidence that that ccoe are going to be my eyes and ears of what's happening in the cloud okay so try and funnel everything and often i found that if you've got a strong pmo office they can work wonders if you've got some sort of gated process is encourage all of the project managers if you're standing up new projects you know have you passed it through the ccoe reporting daily because instead of having project manager and program managers hate having that delay in projects. Well, if they're constantly throwing in 15 minute snips into that CCOE Slack channel or their daily standup, you should be able to go at a fast pace. So that's one, that's the incentive to get that culture change. But the data one is mapping your data. And I don't mean by granular field level. So I've done this in several organizations where you're encouraging the architects with those deliverables, the logical diagram, the interface, the data flow, and that links into, even if you want a simple spreadsheet of a repository of roughly what data is flowing over what link to what third party. The privacy people will love that because they can see, once I understand what data is going to what third party, or internally, they will ask the questions of, an actual fact, what we call it processing activity, but well, what's the reason why they're doing it? From a security perspective, we love it also because if there is a breach, we know who to look for and the size of the breach. And if they've been compromised a third party provider, we know what data they've been exposed to. There are other disciplines I, I've done in the past. I've encouraged organizations to go to guardrails. So, it's more of a granular access control uh, pattern. And I think one, I would, there are other players in there. Snowflake is a, a new uh, capability third party provider. They provide granular access controls. You can do the same in AWS, but once you start having granular access controls to your data and tracking who has access to where, I think that's a good recipe. The other one is, if I take away the cloud element, if you're dealing with a large organization, sometimes it's very, very hard to put your arms around it. There are some other techniques of, when I've worked with a SOP team quite recently, I've asked them to start doing DNS logging and trying to understand that shadow IT 
and if you're doing any network logging, you can start seeing what third parties you're going out and start doing compliance checking. So you can reverse engineer from a bottom up where you're sending out data and the volumes of data as well. And that's worked. And what you're trying to do is a top down approach, good discipline of projects, but sometimes with a large organization, you have to do a discovery process and you're trying to bring those closer to, together. Unfortunately, I have to be the man with the stick. We, we're almost reaching the time limit. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. So, Stephen, I'd, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing this information with the natural hookups that we are all, I guess, getting used to with this remote work and this <laughs> webinar conferencing. But because of this reason, we need more people to the Classic Alliance. We need more research to publish more content. Uh, specifically, we are working currently on a new version of the cloud control matrix. Uh, we're working on the CCAK, that is the um, uh, certified audit, that is going to be a new exam and a new course material that is coming that's going to come out and certify you as uh, or you as an individual as um, certified to uh, run through different compliance. Call it SOC, call it CCM, call it STAR, call it PCI DSS, and so on. But on the cloud. But we need more people to, to effectively share this news and to get other people trained. So please join us, helping us. And it doesn't necessarily need to be specific security people, but it can be everybody, events planner, uh, people that like to do research, people that are, are initiating in security and want to just do mentoring and want to follow somebody. Um, or help us networking or help us running these events. So please join us, uh, get in touch with me or get uh, post a message on our Twitter or LinkedIn page and we will um, get in touch with you. Uh, we have also an award coming up. So if you want, if you're up for the awards, uh, please candidate yourself as a cybersecurity uh, personality of the year, uh, specifically on clouds and we will review it. So I'd like to thank everybody and um, any final comment, any final suggestions, Stephen? Any last message you want to give to everybody before uh, we close the event? No, just uh, if you have questions, reach out to myself or Fran. We're both on the uh, LinkedIn. Okay, thank you very much. Thank See you, guys. Have a good day. Stay safe.